Hey there everyone! For those of you who have been following my channel, you probably know that I have a strong passion for reptiles and amphibians, especially snakes. While most people might flee at the sight of these legless reptiles, I on the other hand always enjoy coming across them and have spent countless hours of my free time searching for them in the wild. Earlier this year, I created a video where I provided strategies for trying to find snakes and ethical practices when interacting with them in the wild. The link to this production is attached to the description below. If I had to pick my favorite snake, the eastern hognose and other members of its kin would be at the top of my list. Over the past couple of years, I have found several individual eastern hognose snakes, but the only other species of hognose I have seen was a DOR dusty hognose in Oklahoma. Fortunately, there is one group of snakes where I have encountered a few species and dozens of individuals, and those are the charismatic and iconic rattlesnakes. For the rest of this video, I want to talk about the four species of rattlesnakes I have encountered in the oh, wild as snake. of today. Holy crap! That is an The timber rattlesnake was the first species of rattlesnake I found in the wild and is also the one that I've observed the most. On a mild October afternoon in 2020, I came across a black tail wrapped around a lichen-covered boulder and peeked underneath to see a gorgeous yellow morph timber, the first rattlesnake I ever saw. The timber rattlesnake is an iconic pit viper to the eastern United States. It is found as far west as eastern Texas and occurs from northeastern Florida up to southern New Hampshire. The timber inhabits a variety of lowland habitats in the western and southern part of its range where it is pretty ubiquitous. However, the timber rattlesnake is most often associated with upland mountain habitats in the northeastern United States, where it exhibits communal denning and summer rookery basking. It is also the only species of rattlesnake that can be found throughout most of this region of the country. While there are parts of the Appalachian Mountains in the northeastern U.S. that still have high densities of timber rattlesnakes, here the species has also suffered drastic losses, including being completely extirpated from Canada and some states. This decline was the result of a bounty system and overcollection that occurred in many northeastern states up until the mid-20th century. Reaching up to four feet on average, but with records approaching six feet in length, the timber is a large rattlesnake that exhibits morphological and behavioral variations throughout its range. Anecdotally, I recognized three distinctive variations of the timber rattlesnake. The majority of the specimens that I have encountered while growing up in the northeastern United States have been what I refer to as Appalachian Timbers. This variation comprises three different color morphs. Individuals that range from yellow to brown with dark crossband markings, which are commonly referred to as yellow or brown morphs, and individuals whose melanism hides lighter pigmentation, which are commonly called black morphs. These three color morphs coexist together in upland rocky habitats of the Appalachian Mountains and surrounding areas from New England and New York down to North Georgia, and always exhibit the communal behaviors I mentioned earlier. However, in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, timber rattlesnakes overwintered near streams and cedar swamps and appear to be more active in colder months compared to the rest of the Appalachian Timbers of the Northeast. The New Jersey Pine Barren timber rattlesnake's life history is similar to that of the western variation of the timber rattlesnake. The western variation of the timber rattlesnake occurs west of the Mississippi River and northward of the Ouachita Mountains. Their life history is similar to that of the Appalachian timber as the western also dens in rocky outcrops of forested hillsides. However, during warmer months, they will follow stream valleys that venture into lower elevated grassland habitats. This includes places such as Oklahoma and Kansas, where timbers are often found crossing roads around large, lowland open fields. On a September night in Oklahoma near Interstate 35, 
which borders the western limit of the Timbers Range. My friend Dean road cruised a young western variant while I was eight miles away simultaneously road cruising an eastern copperhead. The only western variant I have laid eyes on is a collected live specimen that lives in the Oklahoma State University's venomous snake display. The western variation has a slightly different pattern from the Appalachian Timber. They have dark crossbands that cover their dark brown and yellow bodies, but some individuals have a lighter gray or tan coloration. All color morphs of the western variation have a broad rusty brown mid-dorsal stripe that isn't nearly as noticeable on the Appalachian variation, and a dark stripe extending behind the eye that the Appalachian completely lacks. However, there is another variation of the timber rattlesnake that has even a more profound dorsal stripe and even a lighter body coloration. In the coastal plains of the southeastern United States, people refer to the timber rattlesnake as the canebrake rattlesnake. Canebrakes have dark crossbands covering a body that is light tan to gray in color with a reddish brown dorsal stripe running the length of the body and a dark stripe extending behind the eye. Some individuals also have a pinkish tinge to their coloration. Canebrakes prefer to live around wooded stream corridors and swamps in closed canopy lowland pine forests. In some areas, the transition to these habitats from open longleaf pine forests have actually led to an increase in abundance of canebrakes. Ironically, this same transition has threatened the rattlesnake species I'll be talking about next. In these habitats, Canebrakes can be active year-round and will take refuge in root and stump holes, mammal burrows, and in man-made stump piles on cold days during the winter months. However, they can be active on the surface on warmer days at the same time of year. The only canebrakes I have ever seen were in the Okefenokee Swamp of South Georgia when I found two individuals hanging around an old barn on a March afternoon. Overall, I have been fortunate to have seen so many timber rattlesnakes over the past couple of years, which have included massive adults and recently born neonates. I think it's safe to say that this is my favorite species of rattlesnake, but that doesn't mean that I dislike any other species of these charismatic snakes. In the coastal plains of the southeastern United States, a massive snake remains mostly hidden. But when it decides to cross paths with an unsuspecting human, it will make for an unforgettable experience. Reaching six feet in length, but with records of eight foot specimens, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake is the largest rattlesnake in the world. It is aptly named for the diamond shaped markings streaked across an olive brown to almost black body and a face covered with lines and markings. The eyes of the eastern diamondback are darker compared to most other rattlesnakes, which obscures their vertical slit pupils. The eastern diamondback is most abundant in palmetto flatwoods and dry pine lands that extend down from southern North Carolina, throughout Florida, and as far west as southeastern Louisiana. However, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes can be encountered traveling through salt marshes and do occur on barrier islands of the Atlantic Coastal Waterway as well as the Florida Keys. In fact, the highest density of eastern diamondbacks in one area occurs on Little St. Simons Island in South Georgia, where one can quite literally trip over them. However, the eastern diamondback is not so easily encountered throughout most of its range. It has actually suffered severe losses in some parts, most notably in Louisiana, where it is listed as critically imperiled, with only a handful of extant populations remaining. Reasons for the decline of the eastern diamondback have included habitat loss and fragmentation, most notably in longleaf pine forests where the snake overwinters and gopher tortoise burrows. The sight of a massive rattlesnake who isn't afraid to stand its ground often leads to the diamondback being killed when encountered by people. Historically, gopher tortoise burrows were gassed simply to kill the rattlesnakes who were overwintering inside of them. This not only has had severe consequences on eastern diamondbacks, but also gopher tortoises 
eastern indigo snakes, and the 300 plus species of wildlife that use these subterranean refuges. In my experience, most of the eastern diamondbacks I have seen were on Jekyll Island in South Georgia, when I would assist the conservation department in radio tracking the island's population of rattlesnakes. This was a great opportunity to see the different types of habitats these snakes occupied, which ranged from overgrown thicket saw palmetto forest to the dunes around the island's beaches. To the residents and visitors of Jekyll Island, note that your chances of seeing an eastern diamondback here are slim to none, since they avoid all developed areas on the island, and searching for them is like finding a needle in a haystack. With that said, we once stumbled across a young diamondback that had never been encountered before while tracking another diamondback. In another time, my friend found a diamondback in the salt marshes around the island while we were surveying for diamondback terrapins. However, the only diamondback I field herped was one I found in the sand hills of Florida next to a gopher tortoise burrow. No matter how many eastern diamondbacks I end up finding in the wild, everyone will feel like seeing this species for the first time. Truly unforgettable. I think that it is only fitting to go from talking about the largest rattlesnake in the world to speaking about the smallest. While a three-foot body length would be a sub-adult for a timber or an eastern diamondback, it would be a goliath in record-sized specimen for the pygmy rattlesnake. Most adults only reach to around a foot and a half, but it's more common to see individuals only a foot or less. There are three subspecies of the pygmy rattlesnake, and the dusky pygmy is the only one I have seen in the wild. This subspecies is found throughout the entire state of Florida to southern Mississippi, southern Alabama, southern Georgia, and extreme southern South Carolina. Duskies are usually light to dark gray in color, and are outlined with a series of three rows of dark spots, and usually have a profound reddish-brown dorsal stripe. This snake thrives in flatwoods habitats, longleaf pine forests, and can be seen in great numbers around wetlands, especially in Florida. Here, I've had friends who have told me that they've had to watch where they were stepping because the ground was covered with pygmies, and have read people who have posted finding 20 plus in just an afternoon of walking around the edges of wetlands. However, every dusky I have found was crossing a road in South Georgia during the early evening or at night from late April to August. The two other subspecies of pygmy rattlesnake include the Carolina and Western pygmy. The Carolina pygmy occurs in southern North Carolina, throughout most of South Carolina, and the central and northern parts of Alabama and Georgia. While usually a cream color in the southern part of their range, the Carolina pygmy exhibits stunning variations of red coloration, especially in North Carolina. The western pygmy is usually a darker shade of gray compared to most dusky pygmies, and the dark spots are more uniform in distribution. This subspecies occurs in southern Missouri, eastern Oklahoma, most of Arkansas, eastern Texas, and western and southern parts of Louisiana. However, they also occur throughout central and eastern Mississippi, northwestern Alabama, a western slither into Tennessee, and just barely into southwestern Kentucky. Despite their small stature, finding a pygmy rattlesnake never gets old. The southwestern United States has an incredible diversity of rattlesnakes. In the state of Arizona, there are more rattlesnake species here than there are snake species in all of New England. Amongst this large rattlesnake biodiversity, there is one species that stands out above the rest just in terms of sheer abundance. In fact, the western diamondback rattlesnake is so ubiquitous that it's not just the most encountered rattlesnake in the southwestern United States, but also the most encountered species of snake in this area. Reaching up to six feet in length, but with record body sizes smaller compared to those of its eastern cousin, the western diamondback is a large rattlesnake. 
Diamond markings are streaked across the body that is usually gray or brown in coloration with red or yellowish tones and sometimes has a dusty appearance. The pupils are more visible on the eyes of the western compared to the eastern diamondback and less stripes occur on the face. But perhaps the most notable characteristic of the western diamondback are the even black and white bands on the tail, similar to that of a raccoon's. The western diamondback is most common in open desert and grassland lowlands and surrounding rocky cliffs and canyons in very southeastern California, the southern half of Arizona, New Mexico, most of Texas, western Oklahoma, and continues south into Mexico. In these areas, western diamondbacks are encountered by people so often, especially around homes, that many are rounded up and killed in an attempt to mitigate populations from spreading. The most infamous of these roundups occurs in Sweetwater, Texas, where up to 4,000 western diamondbacks are collected and killed during annual roundups. However, there are some places where the western diamondback is not so frequently encountered, and this occurs in the Ozarks and the Washita's of eastern Oklahoma and western Arkansas. Here they inhabit rocky outcrops and pine hardwood forests and overlap with timber rattlesnakes. It was in the Ozark Plateau of eastern Oklahoma where I encountered my first and only western diamondback in the wild. As significant as this encounter was, especially for a lifer, I hope to experience nights where I rode cruise dozens of western diamondbacks in places in the southwest where they are far more common. I have been fortunate to have seen a lot of rattlesnakes at the individual level, but have only just begun to scratch the surface in regards to the number of species found. While this will mostly force me to spend more time in the western United States to search for rattlesnakes I've never seen, I will always enjoy finding the handful of rattlesnakes that reside in the eastern US that I've seen on countless occasions before. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider subscribing to my channel to view more rattlesnake related content. Thank you.